This is Chair, I'm your host Nemanja. And let's first go back to previous week's episode with Bojan Odolski. This discussion is very old, nature versus nurture, and how uh, it's also very controversial over time. But I think from my personal experience that actually uh, through life, uh, both are kind of dynamic in a way, and both contribute either to, um, uh, let's say, personal development or uh, new things that we have to learn. And I think on both sides there are pluses and minuses. Um, I think the innovation is daring, uh, so we actually challenge the companies to unlock the potential of their employees and there the, the big innovation is so not act from fear or from control but uh, look at unused potential there I see a huge potential in, in let's say the working force or the race or whatever you call it where they actually can can have a impact on what's going to happen in the world and also within the companies This is chair, place where we discuss innovations. The human brain is still a very big mystery to us, even though it's 21st century. Today's innovation, or should I say brain innovation, uh, takes on the challenges of integrating technology into the human body. The brainiac behind one such idea is Ivan Gligorievich, uh, even is currently CEO and co-founder of M Brain Train, tech startup focused on high quality variable EEG systems. Uh, after finishing his PhD studies on biomedical engineering, he embarked on the journey to decipher the human brain. So even welcome to chair, pleasure to have you here today. It's my pleasure to be here. So, at the beginning, what was the motivation behind combining biomedicine and EEG systems? Uh, well, uh, the, uh, there are various answers to that questions, but I will, uh, I will, I will be very honest. Uh, uh, the, the, the motivation was the opportunity, uh, because uh, as you said, Biomed, uh, the group where I completed my PhD in uh, Belgium uh, was called Biomed Group, and it dealt with the physiological data and, uh, and processing them. Uh, but the very name suggests that uh, the context in which uh, this was observed was uh, medical somehow. And why was that? Because uh, to uh, reliably observe physiological data, to record physiological data from the human body, regardless of the type of data, uh, you had to have some setups that were more medical than anything else. So bulky in isolated rooms uh, with Control very... Control conditions and everything. Exactly. And... Uh, uh, the issue there was, uh, uh, at least for a number of questions, uh, you, uh, the, there was no efficient way to address them. For instance, if we are uh, talking about our brain, uh, can you uh, say that somebody was uh, relaxed and natural, in, in natural condition if you instructed uh, him or her to sit, you know, still, uh, look up front, not move and be relaxed, you know. So that's it's not natural at all. <laughs> that's not natural at all. And uh, it, it turned out uh, that uh, a number of questions could not be addressed at all. So, for instance, one, uh, one major thing uh, that could not be addressed is how we interact in, in social occasions, like now we're talking. Uh, is my brain the same when I'm talking to you and we have this interaction and when I'm just doing something else or observing some content? So uh, there was a consensus on that, that there was a number of questions that could not be answered on one hand, and on the other hand, there was technology. So uh, I say this uh, maybe often, uh, I don't know if, uh, I, if I said it uh, anywhere public, but basically when I came to Belgium, I, I took my Nokia phone. You could now call it a stupid phone. Back <laughs> then it was just a phone. And uh, uh, by the time I left, I, I was carrying my, my uh, you know, Samsung touchscreen phone in my pocket. And uh, the, the, the revolution that, that happened there was that there was an immense amount of comp uh, computational power in my pocket. I, we all carry computers in our pockets. And together with the infrastructure that supports it, like uh, all kinds of uh, first uh, 1G, 2G, 3G, now 5G networks, uh, this opened an opportunity to, uh, to do all kinds of things. And on the other uh, hand, uh, there, were, there was um, 
electronics and advancement in, in, in electronics. And we realized that uh, uh, a setup that used to take uh, half of this room uh, could be packed in, in, in a box like this and placed behind the head. So it, it still probably looks a bit weird to a lot of people having sort of water polo cap on, on your head. Uh, but let's, let's just call it a start. Uh, uh, but this enabled uh, all of these questions, or at least some of them, to uh, begin to get their, their answers. So we saw that opportunity and we, we were fas fascinated by it, honestly. And, you know, um, the, very, uh, the very thing that you can be the first uh, in something and that you can be a leader in that and uh, yeah that th that was really fascinating we didn't think much honestly about all those business things that they <laughs> that, that they advise that came like, later right talk to the market <laughs> observe the need you know we were just focused on you know let's just do it <laughs> and uh, uh, you haven't told me that who is behind the M brain train uh, well behind the brain train uh, is uh, professor martin devos Uh, from Belgium, uh, Professor Dan Popovic from Serbia, uh, Dr. Bogdan Mijevic, uh, also my colleague from uh, Biomed Group, and myself, we are original founders. So uh, I want to get more deep in, in innovation that you guys did, but uh, since the principles of uh, uh, electroencephalograms, have I said it right? <laughs> okay, it right. so uh, are not so well known in the outside of field of medicine. Can you explain to me and our viewers what exactly is EEG and how does it work? Yes, sure. Um, uh, you know that our brain is composed of neurons and uh, that somehow together and connected in some still very unknown way to us, functionally unknown, um, uh, this creates who we are, basically. And you know that uh, there are layers of brain. You, you, you must have heard about reptilian brain and so on and so forth. But there is something very distinctive in, in our brain uh, compared to our, uh, let's say, animal relatives. And uh, what we know is that uh, that very distinctive thing is, um, uh, let's say, um, focused in the most uh, evolutionarily uh, new uh, part of our brain, and that's ne neocortex, that's like just on top. In this very thin layer of brain, uh, it, it is contained of most of who we are and what we do and how we reason and, and our memories and how we talk and so on. Um, it turns out that uh, when these neurons work, they, uh, let's say, fire, we call it fire, uh, fire these uh, spike-like events. And on a single neural level, uh, this is very hard to observe. Uh, but uh, together, these neurons, they, they, create these, um, uh, they, they create these spikes and that, that's how they communicate to, uh, to one another. Uh, and by uh, if you place let's say some kind of electrode near uh, near this neural tissue, you're able to observe uh, difference in in voltage and currents. But let's stick to to voltage, uh, electrical voltage. And it turns out that if you place uh, some electrodes on top of your brain, uh, you could actually uh, record some of these changes. Now, uh, to be able to observe anything at all. Uh, a lot of neurons beneath that electrode have to be working uh, very synchronously to add these very small, small amounts of potential difference to some observable level that you can pick up at the surface of your head. So this is, uh, you could call it uh, one very, very simple model of what, ha what really happens. So we are dealing with one very simplistic uh, view on our brain. Like imagine that you are looking at a picture and instead of a high density picture, you see one just so uh, pixelized thing that you, you, know, you, you need to focus to see you know, who, who's on that picture at all. That's the analogy that, that, that I use with the, with, the, with the EG. So with this homework done, we can move on to your innovation. And uh, uh, I would like you to, to share to me uh, how it was conceived and uh, uh, what is more interesting, how, uh, how this innovation transformed over the years. 
Uh, yes, well, it was conceived um, uh, with the help of a lot of uh, beers in uh, mostly German breweries and a couple <laughs> of friends uh, that, uh, that share this, this idea. So uh, basically the, at, the, at the start uh, there was uh, three of us, uh, all former colleagues in, uh, in this biomed group that I mentioned it, and at uh, KU Leuven in, in Belgium. One of uh, us, let's say, like let's put it like that, uh, was already um, uh, on his next post position in, as a postdoc in in uh, University of Oldenburg, Germany, and uh, it is uh, uh, it is the focus of of uh, of uh, research of Professor Martin De Vos uh, that uh, got us uh, uh, interested in like what could be done, and then we started brainstorming. Uh, there was some proof of concept already uh, being done at, at this it, at this lab with some duct tape prototypes, uh, the, you know, uh, playing around with what what was available on the market. But we realized that if we could really uh, integrate it and uh, you know bring it to to the next level, uh, because what was you know that duct tape prototype was not comparable to to say, uh, say research grade equipment. It was way more simple, more more limited. And that's the, that's the start uh, of the idea. Then we started brainstorming how we could uh, get it to work. Uh, we, you know, proposed that we do it here in Serbia, more largely because we uh, we had some kind of network of people that we assumed that would come handy as collaborators. We got uh, f uh, a grant from the Innovation Fund of uh, Republic of Serbia in 2012, and that's how we started. Of course, it took us uh, it took us some time to uh, to get going to realize that we are a company and not uh, and you then, know a then project. Then questions because... started to arise about the business and the market. In it. Yes, the, those boring <laughs> questions that uh, that really you know defocused us from our work that we found really really a menace. But you know, of course, we were wrong. But that's a learning curve. At, at the end, as uh, as you asked, uh, the innovation was the 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 very small uh, uh, like uh, box with some electronics in it that you uh, hold behind your head with an electrode cap that communicates with your uh, mobile phone or a computer, and that allows you to go in uh, let's say different conditions in even home environment and do uh, a lot of things. So. Uh, of course, we had different ideas on what this should start with. One of these was um, a brain uh, uh, rehabilitation uh, following stroke. Uh, this was uh, like a first uh, uh, first set of users, let's say, uh, use this for uh, for research in this domain. Like, can you help someone to uh, to recover or partially recover following stroke in some friendly conditions like home? Uh, but then we realized that uh, this actually extends to a, lo uh, a lot more questions than, than this. And uh, since, of course, we didn't have any real marketing or real market PR strategy or call it like you will, uh, we relied on word of mouth. And most of our first users just were, were some friends of the other users who said, OK, oh, this is really cool. I need this, you know, I want to do this or that. You know, I, I want to do sports studies. You know, I'm really interested in how top performers, uh, you know, get in the zone or, or something like that. And then, you know, whole thing followed with the auditory research, with visual research, with the social studies and so on. So where are you today? What are the challenges today? Um, well, like uh, like I'm sure you heard people say, uh, small kids, small problems, big kids, big <laughs> problems. Uh, that is also uh, the case for us. So as you roll, uh, there are a lot of things that you want to do uh, that uh, for, for some reason you still cannot do and you work towards uh, uh, getting there. Uh, we enhanced our device, solved a lot of uh, challenges that early uh, users uh, had. We just recently launched our Smarting Pro device. Uh, the, that really is, uh, I believe, uh, the best device by far uh, in the market worldwide for, for mobile EG research. Um, that is, uh, let's say, one direction. So we established ourselves as a supplier of, uh, of top-notch equipment for, for research. 
But um, even more than that, let's say that there is a track on how to utilize this technology further and make it uh, useful for everyday people or in uh, challenges that, that life and work uh, brings. So uh, a number of, of uh, technological obstacles that in research is actually not such an obstacle like gelling your electrodes. There is a conductive gel that you put in these electrodes to, uh, to make the contact better is unacceptable in, in, in other conditions. Uh, you know, you, we want our electronics or whatever we use to be very friendly and no-brainer if you want to call it like that. So uh, we are addressing uh, a lot of these challenges and um, we believe that uh, such devices uh, have a bright future in, in future work and life that could en enhance uh, who you are, how you perform, help you be better and be more fun. And with that said, uh, how do you think that your product is going to impact uh, the world of medicine? Um, well, I think in, in many ways, uh, our, I have to say that our product is, uh, although it is used in, in medical research, uh, most of the users are, come from actually cognitive psychology. So uh, answering questions about healthy human brain rather than, than, uh, than uh, ill. Uh, however, in, in, in the world of medicine, there, there are a lot of questions that, uh, that actually scream for, for, uh, for an answer, call it like that. So, uh, for instance, uh, coming from the most obvious ones, uh, like epilepsy, you have a number of people that, uh, that need to be uh, accurately diagnosed, uh, which is a very hard task in still uh, bulky medical setups, because in medical, the main things go slower than, than in, in, in the others. For, uh, for uh, objective reasons, of course. But if you could make this technology available for more people so that they can do some kind of pre-screening at home uh, where uh, epilepsy is suspected, then uh, this, could, uh, this could bring uh, a lot of benefits. I think one or two percent of the world population ha suffers from, from epilepsy. Then uh, in even more unknown domains uh, like um, Alzheimer's disease uh, or dementia, uh, this is also very hard to diagnose. We don't know what exactly led to that. Uh, as one uh, neurologist friend, I could call, it, call him like that, told me when I asked him about uh, healthy human brain, he said, well, I don't know how healthy human brain works. And I was like, <laughs> how don't you know? Like, you, you are your authority in this domain. He said, well, you know, um, to tell you the truth, um, not many healthy people come to visit me, you know. People come to visit me when that something is often very terribly wrong with them. So his point of reference is... Exactly. So we realized that, uh, the, the, that we don't know what led to that. Uh, and uh, w w this is what we call biomarkers. So imagine that uh, before somebody visited a doctor for such a thing, there was uh, some kind of continuous recording uh, that uh, helped us identify... Uh, these biomarkers, so what led to that, we could have a more timely rea reaction, maybe even reverse some of the processes, we, we, we don't know. But the problem is that healthy people do not go and, and, and get their EEG done, you know, on a regular basis. And our idea is, if that could be coupled with something that you immediately need, some, some of your daily need, that, that could come as, as, a, as a side effect. So let's imagine that we all uh, have some kind of invisible or seamless or, or concealed way to record our EEG that makes our lives better. And as a side effect, we have the ability to see and get some kind of warning with, when something is changing. That could be the, the real benefit. That's the medical, medical sector we're talking about. But the other point that I also touched is uh, our everyday life benefits that could come from that. Uh, imagine we, we call that a third hand. So something that enhances uh, your performance, uh, not for the sake of uh, like core performing like a robot, but uh, for the sake of uh, being better, uh, that's more fulfilled. Uh, now, in today's world, we, we see because we live in a world of abundance. 
we do not worry like our grandfathers what we are going to eat are we going to survive uh, we worry uh, about uh, other things and uh, we started uh, thinking about uh, and wanting to be more to be um, to be better to learn more to uh, to be better at our work to advance uh, to to do all kinds of things uh, to relax more to meditate uh, all of these kind of things I want to ask you about uh, data uh, since I'm sure that you're collecting a lot of it uh, from usage of your system uh, how, you, uh, how are you leveraging, leveraging this in, in terms of uh, changing the product or uh, some other uh, area oh boy that's a very difficult question because uh, there is obviously an ethical component to that privacy component so to tell you the truth uh, for most of our users we do not get access to their data uh, and it has to be that way you have to be very transparent on, on, on what you do of course with uh, some others where we are contracted to, to do something with that data that this is a different point um, uh, we do collect a lot of data that uh, on our own uh, in a very carefully designed uh, settings. Uh, this uh, in information era that we are living in, in the era of, uh, of advanced algorithms that we are seeing uh, in the domain of AI, machine learning, uh, help us uh, actually find better algorithms for, for, for some uh, things uh, traditionally algorithms. I, I'm not sure how, how how much people know and how algorithms uh, come to be, let's say. But basically, um, our human mind uh, is, uh, is, is uh, tuned toward um, some kind of insights. So you, you, you see some things and you see, uh, you, you hypothesize what you should you do to get somewhere. And that's how uh, algorithms uh, came to be. We, take some signals, we process them in some way with certain assumptions and say, okay, when we do this or and that, this number of steps, we are going to have a certain feature and this feature is going to uh, correlate with, uh, with a certain thing that we can observe, behavioral thing, for instance. Uh, then we test this and uh, if we have high correlation on that, we say, okay, this feature is a reliable uh, predictor or a reliable uh, sign that uh, this and that happens. Uh, but uh, are these algorithms optimal? They're not. They're not at all. Uh, there is uh, no way to tune this uh, in, in some, uh, you know, uh, to, to let's say finally tune this. And the uh, algorithms that we are seeing now that, you know, most of you or of us uh, have at least some insight to. So we, we heard about deep learning, AI and so on. We know that our, our you know, Google works uh, in, in some way to, that, that knows us, that, you know, can assist us in some way. But these algorithms are tuned for specific purposes that are not really uh, good for the types of signals with, that we are seeing in, uh, seeing uh, with the EG. So uh, we are working on, on uh, algorithms that uh, take advantage from uh, the tools we have, but are conditioned to, uh, to the purposes that we want to address. The real uh, issue with the brain is very often uh, not having a gold standard. And that is the real challenge. It's tricky. Because uh, our brain is, is a tricky organ in itself. Uh, if I asked you uh, what was your best holiday ever, you would uh, probably tell me that, uh, that this was a perfect holiday and you were with a bunch of friends and every moment was perfect. But basically, uh, your brain is probably lying to you because, uh, yes, indeed, that was a per best, the best holiday that you have. Uh, but in this memory recall, every time you change something in your memory for that, and it appears uh, now to be a, a lot better than it actually was. So the, there is a bias, even if you ask someone uh, about something, uh, this uh, recall bias. Uh, so uh, the only way to, to really know about things is uh, just some kind of objective analysis at the moment when things are happening. But even this is tricky. 
if you uh, watch a movie and you say I was scared, well, were you really scared? How scared are you? Uh, like even if I ask you to scale something, then uh, this scale also might be biased. So you need to uh, really carefully design uh, data sets and experiment settings based on which you're going to extract uh, features from uh, this AI uh, approach and be uh, confident that these features are really reliable and that next time you record these features, yes, that will mean that, you know, you were scared of Freddy Krueger or whatever. <laughs> uh, okay, so earlier you told me uh, uh, how your uh, invention, uh, how your innovation, to be precise, is influencing the medicine. But I want to ask you from different perspective, uh, personal perspective, because lately we hear a lot about mental well-being and uh, how this effect affects work, probably because of this crisis and everything that we have changed in the workplace and so on. So how does stuff like mental fitness and or music therapy really help people uh, uh, today you know when you wake up and you know you're going to have a bad day right um, but you don't quantify it you just uh, can maybe remember after a few days or say okay I was really good at that day or, or not uh, measuring whatever that is that you're measuring uh, gives you a perspective and gives you uh, some tools to affect things. Uh, our already mentioned bias uh, don't allow us to see things that, that way. Uh, but you, you can see that already now uh, simple time is not the currency of work as it used to be. Uh, if you uh, were producing uh, bricks for, for houses, then you would have a then the time would very uh, be a measure that correlates with the output of your work. Number and, of bricks. Yeah, number of bricks. Uh, but in today's world, like you, you see all the creative activities that happen. W what can you measure there, right? Uh, so what do you do? Do you, you know, do you make your designer just you know log in when he comes to work or or she and log out? Does it tell you anything? It doesn't. Uh, and we realize that, uh, not only us, of course, the entire world. So uh, the currency is something between uh, motivation or effective work and actually motivation and uh, well-being lead you to this effective work. Uh, for that to happen, you're, you have to be conditioned well. You have to sleep well, you have to eat well, you have to have productive behavior all those things that uh, we are often not in control of and that we disregard because we cannot measure these things, uh, let, let's say, uh, very precisely. We cannot say, or at least nobody thinks about that, how, you know, a, a burger that I ate today and <clears throat> uh, yesterday and the day before will affect who I am uh, tomorrow. <clears throat> uh, that brings us to the space of how to optimize ourselves. So, uh, one of these things, as you measured, is uh, as you mentioned, is music. Uh, we all know that music affects us in some way. Uh, we all know that we can focus with some playlists. Uh, we all know that uh, we can calm down with with something. We all know that if there is some repetitive task that we want to do, we better put some um, some appropriate music for that. But this is all uh, very. Um, um, empirical, uh, let's say. Uh, I believe that the technology that we are working on can, uh, can make this uh, thing less empirical and more knowledge and data driven. Uh, if uh, uh, these things are highly individual and uh, there is no uh, one fit all solution. If you and I were listening to the same type of music, uh, the output would not be the same. Maybe I would be distracted by this music and you would be a great performer and advancing and whatever. Um, in principle, uh, we talk about productivity, we talk about stress. <clears throat> and with all the tools that we have in today's world, we haven't addressed these questions precisely for that reason, because there is no one-fit-all solution. 
Otherwise, we would all just uh, read uh, Novak Djokovic's book on how to focus and, and we would all be <laughs> focused. <laughs> and we are going to have a great backend, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we will be focused, you know, we will say, oh, this person, you know, this one person figured it out, so let's just apply his formula. Doesn't work like that. Our individuality doesn't uh, allow us to do so. Physiology, on the other hand, uh, if you ask me uh, before most EEG, can help uh, address these things primarily by screening you, your habits, what works, what doesn't work, and make some kind of informed uh, loops and, uh, and, and solutions uh, that, that would actually uh, guide you in the direction uh, of uh, where you want to be, right? If you are a worker in a factory, uh, maybe uh, alerting you to upcoming danger or telling you that you're not uh, in, let's say, good mental sh uh, shape to conduct the work you have been doing. For instance, flight controllers, right? You cannot have a hang hangover flight controller unless or a pilot unless you're diesel wa wash <laughs> diesel Washington and you can land the plane perfectly. Um, so. Uh, this is uh, this is one layer uh, one layer of, of, of these things. Uh, another layer is uh, is you know uh, getting you to uh, uh, to relax uh, efficiently and uh, assisting you in that in that way and making your life more fun. Um, so I believe that we are going to start seeing uh, these variables. Um, one thing that you didn't ask me, but I'll still uh, say why I think this is uh, this is the way to go uh, in physiology in general, but EEG uh, specifically. Uh, we are surrounded by all kinds of things that uh, that have some kind of measure of our behavior, starting with your phone. What these uh, systems lack is uh, is directly how your brain responds to such things. We can map your behavior, but we cannot map your uh, responses. So we cannot say uh, uh, what fits you, uh, what you like when you were distracted, how how distracted you were, how to you know make you less distracted, uh, and and so on. So for these things, you have to measure. Uh, brain directly and you have to do it at the moment when something happens not after that because of the brain bias of the recall bias that that uh, that I spoke about so that's that's what I think and I think that we are going to start seeing these variables uh, come today or in maybe five years maybe even less so uh, we are coming to my question about the future and the uh, uh, this industry that we are talking about right now, it's in conception. How do you see it in, let's say, 15 years from now? And uh, to finish with uh, something a bit irrational, will we be living in the matrix uh, at the end of this century? Uh, you know, I, I also don't like uh, people watching at my screen uh, when I'm doing something. I've, you know, I, I feel under pressure even my screen and uh, the people I'm surrounded with you could say that even if they saw that I'm doing I'm slacking uh, probably they wouldn't tell me but uh, I don't think that uh, these technologies should be uh, invasive in the sense of uh, control uh, I think that the uh, there is an ethical component to that, uh, but not ethical in a traditional sense, but ethical in the sense that we should aim to, uh, to assist people, not to lock them in some kind of jail. And uh, if you, for instance, look at the industry and uh, all this uh, lean pro production uh, pioneered by Toyota, I think that this uh, th th this uh, lean methodology focused on the uh, production uh, and not on the humans. So it optimized production, but it didn't optimize uh, our mental uh, mental states that uh, that we face uh, during those things. And I think this is this is becoming a topic now. So I don't think that physiology here will be used to extract, you know, to squeeze, you know, people even more. Uh, but to see where and how people react and adopt the other uh, the other part of the equation to them, and not vice versa, because we clearly have limits. You know, uh, not extending the story too much, but can you calculate as fast as your calculator can? 
Of course not. So there is a limit. We, 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 there are many more, but so, and we cannot change ourselves. There is a, a still irre, irreplaceable component of our soul. So we have to adapt our surroundings to, to, uh, to match us and our uh, abilities. Uh, so I believe that uh, this is one part of the of the equation. The other part of the equation is the technology that develops on the other uh, on the other end. Uh, we have industry where majority of uh, errors are human related uh, and uh, and not uh, technology related. But we as humans have to uh, have to keep um, uh, liability in our hands. Because you cannot say that uh, AI was uh, was at fault that somebody died or something crashed. It's not an acceptable answer. It can happen once or twice while you're developing the technology, but it's not an acceptable answer. So we have to find um, a layer in between uh, to uh, efficiently communicate with the advancing technology. And I think for this layer in between, uh, human physiology relating mostly on our mental states is, is a crucial step. Ivan, thank you so much for this conversation. I've enjoyed a lot. And uh, for you out there, uh, thank you for watching and subscribe if you haven't already. And see you next Thursday for some new innovation talks. Thank you.